Hello, I'm glad you're able to watch this message. It'd be great if you could visit sometime, but if not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area. Hope to see you sometime. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a loving God. Thank you for loving us more than we can even understand. Thank you for providing for all of our needs. You've given us priorities that will help us live lives that are the very best for us because that's what you want. You want the very best for us. You've provided for our salvation, Lord. Jesus, thank you for being the path to salvation. You're the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that nobody comes to the Father except through you. You stepped out of heaven, added a human nature to your divine nature, came down to earth, lived in the same kind of environment that we all do, exposed to the same trials, tribulations, temptations, all of that, but lived a sinless life, a perfect life. You gave your life on the cross, shed your blood to pay for our sins, something we couldn't do for ourselves. Then you were buried and resurrected to a new life so that if we accept this free gift, we can have a new life in you. Thank you for that. Holy Spirit, thank you for convicting us of the need for even needing salvation. Thank you for coming into us and indwelling us when we accept Christ as our Lord. Thank you for giving us these words we're going to talk about today and helping us understand them. So we commit this time to you now, God, and for our part, our prayer is that we'll honor you with the use of this time. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if our goals and resolutions are based on the priorities for our life, it seems to me that those that have the best chance of success, right, are those that align with God's priorities and those that we pray for. And I think there's a verse here. I think 1 John 5, 14, 15 uh, tells us that. It says, let's see, do we have charts here? Oh, never mind. Yeah. I'm looking, at, they're not up there. So 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask for anything, anything, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So this says to me, that if, if our goals are based on our priorities and our priorities are to honor him, he will honor our goals. He will honor our priorities. He will give us what we've asked for. But if, if, we, if our, our goals are aligned with our own self-gratification, right, not in his will, then we're on our own. So the, the whole deal here is that our priorities need to be to honor God. That's what we should be living for. That's what we should get up in the morning committed to do, is to honor him. And that was really brought home to me a few years ago in this very place. We had a young man who, had, who worked for the church, and one of his job was to set these chairs up on Saturday night. He was very diligent about it. And you look around at how precisely set up these chairs are. It takes a lot of work to do that. And this kid was 17 years old, he came up here every Saturday, and he did that. His buddies are out goofing off, doing whatever 17-year-olds do. He's up here diligently doing this. And one time I was up here for some reason, probably Amy had me up here doing something, I'm sure, and I happened to watch him do this for a little while. And what he'd do is he'd, he'd line up the first row against some marks that were on the floor. Then he had a measuring stick, right, on, on a little pole, and he would measure from a chair in the first row to the second, every chair, every chair, every chair. And he did that for every row. And then he had sticks to measure the aisles. He was very, very precise in doing that. And so after, I was really impressed. I didn't know what it took to set this, this place up, and you guys probably didn't either. So I was very impressed, and at the end, I went up and I thanked him for doing that. Here's what he said to me, and this is always going to stick with me. 17-year-old boy, he said to me, well, thank you, Mr. He did this with uh, great humility. Thank you, Mr. Alberts, 
but I'm doing this for the Lord. That's why I'm doing this. He gave me this job to do. It's the only job I can do here. And I want to do it with his help. I want to do it the very best that I can. I'm thinking to myself, that's not the kind of priorities I probably had when I was 17 years old, but I should have. That was, wasn't that great? I mean, that was awesome to me. It will always stick with me. He knew, just like we do, that we can trust our lives to God. God loves us more than we can even imagine. Not only does he love us more, because of that, he wants the very best for us. So when he gives us priorities to live for our lives, we can know that those are the very best ways for us to live. That's the way we ought to want to do it, because he loves us so much. Look at Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't even like him. We turned our backs on him. We hated him, right? Nothing to do with him. Even so, he loved us. He died for us. No human would ever do that. And because he loves us that much, he wants the very best plan. He has the very best plan for our lives, right? And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what he wants for everybody in this room. He wants to give us a future and a hope. And if we follow the priorities he laid out in our life, that's the direction our lives will go. That's why we need to do that. Now, our text today is Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, and we'll go through that in a minute. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. A lot of times when he wrote a letter, it was to correct some bad thing that was going on in the church, but this one wasn't. This one was meant to be circulated to all the churches in the area, and, and he wrote these words to encourage the people in the churches, to let them know how much God loved them and that God had priorities for their lives so that they could live the very best life. Here's what it says. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for for Christ. I submit to you that there are three priorities here in this passage, and we're going to go through those in detail. The first one is, God wants us to be intentional about how we live our lives. He doesn't want us to go through life in a haphazard way. Be very intentional about it. And and, and So look again at 15, uh, 16 here, these verses. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. I think there are four main points here in this verse. The first thing... He says, look carefully then how you walk. The Greek word for look here is blepo. And what it means is be cautious, be on guard. So he's saying, when you're going through life, look very carefully, be cautious, be on guard always how you walk. And the word for walk here, the Greek word is peripateo. And it, it's not so much you know one foot in front of the other. What it is is how you conduct your life, how you comport your life. So he's saying in this phrase, Be very intentional about how you go through life. Be very intentional about it. And then in the next three phrases, he kind of explains what what he means by that. It says, walk through your life not as unwise, but as wise. So the Greek word for wise here is sophos. And it also means skillfully. So we are supposed to live our lives in a skillful way, right? Right? with wisdom. So when I think about what does that mean? What is to live it skillfully? What does that mean? Pastor Ben has told us a lot that what that means is 
uh, having knowledge and applying the knowledge to our lives. He wants us to be in the Word and be able to apply it. It's kind of like one of the skilled labor trades here in this country, right? I've got two grandsons that I'm very proud of. They are in the electrical apprenticeship. To be an electrician in this state, this country, whatever, you have to go to school and on-the-job training for four or five years before they'll let you do it, right? So you go to school, you get the knowledge, but that's not good enough. They teach you on-the-job training how to apply that knowledge. And until you are able to apply that knowledge with great skill, you're not allowed to do it. God wants us to live our lives that way. He wants us to be apprentices in the Bible. He wants us to be in the Word. He wants us to understand what's in there and be able to apply that to our lives. That's, to me, what this is saying. And then he, he wants us to make the best use of the time. Our lives are short. I don't know if you ever think about that. I never did. When I was 16 or 17 and somebody would talk to me about, you know, being in their middle 70s and being a grandfather or great-grandfather, which I am now, that seemed like forever away to me. Now that I am that guy, I look in the rearview mirror and I ask myself, where did the time go? It went really fast. It goes fast. Now, the word for time here, kairos, can also mean opportunity. So what he's saying here is make the best use of your time and the opportunities that I give you in your life. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say, why? Because the days are evil. So what does that mean? But the days are evil. Days here means the current time that you're living in, the culture that's around you. They're evil. They are not aligned with God. And evil also can mean worthless. So the culture around Ephesus in those times was primarily based on Roman thought and Greek thought. And in those days, those two cultures both were very interested in self-satisfaction. Whatever I want, sinful or not, especially sinful, I'm going for that. That's what they wanted. So they were living self-indulged lives. Not only that, but you could worship any god you wanted to, except in the Roman culture, you also had to worship the emperor, right? But other than that, everything was fair. When I think about what that culture was like, and I compare it to what our culture is like, I see a lot of similarity there. God is saying that's not the way to do it. Don't follow that culture. Stay away from that culture. Be counterculture. And Peter, Peter, I think, says it even lets us know why the cultures are doing that. He says in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says the same thing Paul did, right? Be sober-minded, be watchful, be careful about your life, look at what's going on around you and avoid it. Your adversary, and he tells us why things are progressing the way they are. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's saying, hey, all this that's going on, all these things you see going on, the culture going in the wrong direction, the evil one is doing that. He is the one who's leading the culture in that way, and he will never lead people to me. He's always going to lead them to self-satisfaction, self-indulgence. That's what that's all about. It was going on then, it's going on now. The, the devil knows that time is getting short. He also knows what's going to happen to him at the end of time. And he wants to take as many people with him as possible. Make no mistake, the devil hates us. So if he is the one kind of orchestrating where the culture is going to go, that's not good. So that's, uh, that's what Peter, Peter is warning us against that. We need to make the best use of our time, the best use of our opportunities to counter that. He's urgent. The devil is urgent to take people with him. We need to be urgent to, to not be one of those, and the people in this room are not, but we need to help other people be real too. 
right, and not follow that culture. We need to be urgent about it. I'm going I'm to tell you one thing that happened to me not very long ago to just kind of point out um, the urgency that we need to feel. I was in the hospital. There was, and I was uh, talking to a man who was at the end of his life, and, um, and he was not a believer, and I knew that. I talked to him for quite a while, comforted him like chaplains are supposed to do, spent the time, and, and, then I, and we had a very good discussion. I left the room, and he, um, but I did not share the gospel with him. I didn't even try to share the gospel with him. I left the room, walked down the hall, and the further away I got from his room, the worse I felt about that. I was being convicted by the Holy Spirit. My chest got tight, and, 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 and eventually it felt like there was like a 100-pound rock on my heart. Now, I know that I couldn't stand a 100-pound rock on my heart, but that's what it felt like. I turned around, went back to his room, and I said, hey, um, you ever think about spiritual things? And he said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do, especially lately. I don't know what's going to happen next. Can you help me understand what will happen next? So we, I answered his questions, and as we, we went on, um, I shared the gospel with him. He was very excited to hear that, very excited to hear it, and he accepted it. The next day, I went to see him, and he had passed. He was gone. That's the urgency. If I had missed that opportunity, it would have plagued me forever. Don't miss opportunities. So this whole part of what I'm going to talk about today is all about wisdom, right? Now, it, uh, Paul, in Colossians 4, 5, tells us to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. What he's, and outsiders here means people that are not yet in the church. What he's saying, you need to gain this wisdom, not just for yourself. You need to be able to apply it to other people's lives, too. And get this, he says the same thing, right? Making the best use of the time. So where do we get the wisdom? Where does wisdom come from? Remember, wisdom is applied skill. Getting skills, knowledge, I mean, and applying that. That's wisdom. The knowledge that we need is from the Bible, right? We need to know what's in the Bible, and more than that, actually apply it to our lives. Now, Pastor Ben tells us a lot to be in the Word, always in the Word. And he, even this morning, uh, advised us to go through the Word for a year. Right? You can get through the whole Bible in a year. And he's made it really easy for us. The website has a couple of Bible reading plans. The, Bible, the app, which I don't know how to use, but it has those plans... <laughs> Also, the information table has them written out for old guys like me. So there's no excuse to not have one. And what a Bible reading plan does is walks you through what you should read every day, and there are several different ways of doing this to suit your fancy, so that it, within a year you can go through it. And I did mine uh, last night, and, and the reading that for me last night took 15 minutes, and that's normally what it does. That's not a lot of investment, is it? You can stand in line waiting for your Starbucks 15 minutes, right? That's all it takes. So we need to be in the Word. And, and when we go through it, we may not get all the way through it. We're certainly not going to memorize the Bible in a year. We're not going to know where all the Bible verses are in a year. But the more we put it into us, into our minds, into our hearts, the easier it will be for us to recall when we need that to happen, right? And God will do that for us. So the advertisement here is to be in the Word. Colossians 3.16 says that, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. My wife and I did this together. We did it together for years. The last thing that we did before we retired at night, was, was do our part of the reading plan. And that was the best part of my day. I really missed that. But I still do it. Be in the Word. It's easy. And the more you do it, the easier it is. All right, so the, the second priority that he has for us is to understand his will for our lives. 
What does he want for our lives, right? And it's really clear in verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand the will, what the will of the Lord is. Now this word for foolish, aphron, also means without reason or ignorant. Life is, is full of choices, right? Life is one choice after another. My son likes to say that. He said that for years. That's what it is. And what this passage is telling us is that we need to be choices that are re- do choices that are reasoned, uh, not out of ignorance. And, um, and they need to be in God's will. The, the word for will here, philema, means his desire, his purpose for us. So when we make a choice, we need to understand that it's a choice that God would support, that honors God. So I've been in hospital rooms and, and said these things to folks, and, and a lot of people will ask me, well, how do I know? How do I know if I'm in God's will? How do I know the choice I'm making is in his will or not? And here's what I've come to telling them. The first thing we need to do is pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray unceasingly, right? We need to do that throughout our life throughout our day. Every decision that we make, we need to pray about. And if we do that, he will answer. And we need to listen for his voice. We need to listen to him speaking to us. And I'm going to tell you now that there are four ways, four primary ways that I believe that he speaks to us. And the Bible tells us this. The first one, he speaks to us through his word. Are you going to say, hear me uh, say that uh, a, a lot of times today, you already have. Second, Second Timothy 3, 16 through 8, or 17 says, all scripture, not some, all scripture is God-breathed by God or is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof. I didn't know what that word meant, so I looked it up, and what it means is rebuking or reprimanding. That's what it means. For correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible has something to say about every situation that we will find ourselves in in life. And we need to be in the Word to know what it says, right? The second thing is, he'll speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit in them. We all do. The Holy Spirit knows, knows the Bible very well, right? He wrote it. If we're in the Word, He will recall it for us when we need it to happen. The more we're in there, in the Word, the the better He can do that for us. The other thing He'll do is He'll give us peace with our choices. We need to check our decisions against what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Are we at great peace with the decision we're about to make? Or are we not? If we're at great peace then the Holy Spirit is telling us that's okay. When I made the decision to walk out of that hospital room down the hall, I was not at peace at all. My heart was, was going crazy. The Holy Spirit was telling me, hey, Steve, you just made a bad choice. You need to go make a different choice. And he'll do that. John 14, 26, Jesus says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I've said to you. He will tell us what the Bible is telling us, what the Bible needs us to know, or what he, he'll tell us when we need to know it, what the Bible says about our situation. And then it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. He will give us peace in our decisions if they're in the will of God. So that's the second way we can test whether our decisions are in his will. The third is our circumstances. Jesus, when he was walking the earth, said to his disciples, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the the Son does likewise. Jesus knew, as he was ministering to people, He could see God's plan unfolding around him in the circumstances that he came across. He could feel that God was working in him and through him. And God does the same thing with us. 
He's sovereign over everything. The circumstances in our life that happen, God is the one orchestrating all of that. He works in us, and he works through us if we'll let him do that. So we need to look at our choices and see whether or not we can see his hand in that. Is he opening doors for us? Is he closing doors for us? Has he, he had our life on a trajectory that would naturally lead us to this decision in this situation? Or is he not? Is he leading us in some other way? He's in all of our circumstances. He speaks to us through our circumstances. And then the final one is that he speaks through other believers. Every one of us has the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit will help believers speak truth into other believers' lives. Not only will he help us do that, he, that's an expectation. He wants us to do that. Believers are supposed to help hold each other accountable and to lift each other up. And I think I, you see that in two verses here. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Every believer has the Holy Spirit in them. When he comes into us, he gives each one of us a gift, a special gift, right? And we all have a different complement of gifts, right? He also gives us biblical knowledge as we absorb the Bible. He helps us interpret our circumstances. Each one of us can use that to help somebody else. It says the common good. The Holy Spirit is the glue that binds the church together. It is what unites the church, right? And we are given gifts and circumstances, not just for our own benefit, but to benefit others within the church of God, right? And the Holy Spirit will help us do that. The second thing that he says here is in Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, other believers, for we are all members of one another. We are all members of the church, right? And so every one of us is commissioned to speak the truth into each other's lives. Right? So if you have a decision to make, if I have a decision to make, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times I'll bias it. It's like, I want the decision to be this. So I will rationalize like crazy so that the decision turns out to be this. But if we ask the advice of other godly people, they'll see through that bias, right? They can wipe that away and they can help us make godly decisions. We need to ask them, hey, am I, am I rationalizing here or is God's hand really in this? And they'll tell us. And a really good place to do that is in small groups. It's an advertisement for small groups, right? All right, so the four tests to determine whether it's in his, we are in his will. I've seen that work out in my life several times. And, and I'm going to give you one example that happened again here at the church. Several years ago, Pastor Ben um, asked me to pray about being the treasurer here. And I've been the treasurer for uh, 10 years, so you know the answer. But when he asked me that, I told him I would pray for it. But I have to admit, when I went home, I was, I was not... I thought, man, my plate is already full. I don't know that I have time to do all of that. So I went home to my godly advisor who happened to be Devona, my wife, and she was really good at telling me uh, when, I, when my plate was overflowing and then I couldn't add anything more to it. Spouses can see that when we can't a lot of times. So I was fully expecting her to say, you're right, Steve, you don't have time for that. And, but that's not what she said. Here's what she said. She said, I've watched you you know, throughout your career, God has put you in positions where you deal with finances more and more throughout your career. In the last 10 years, uh, he sent me to broken, major broken pro programs at this company to help them get out of their financial situation or to prevent them from getting into a bad financial situation. Over and over again, for 10 years, that happened. And she said, I think maybe um, you can do this 
standing on your head. She didn't say that, I said that. But because the budget that you're being asked to look at and help with is minuscule compared to what you've been dealing with, and it doesn't have any problems going on with it. God has trained you to do this. You need to do it. I'm thinking, hey, I'm shocked. You never say that. You always say, I've got too much work to do. <laughs> and at this, uh, this company that I worked for, I did. I put everything into it, and uh, my heart and soul into it, and whatever I was asked to do, I would do that. And uh, so when I, when I whined to her about this uh, treasure thing a little bit, not too much, she reminded me that whenever she would tell me there's too much on your plate, I would come back with Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. And that would be my justification for working way too much overtime. And she told me, in those cases, that's not what you were doing. You were working so you could climb the corporate ladder. Now you are being asked to work for God, truly for God. Nobody's going to care about you climbing any corporate ladder. Well, that kind of took all my arguments away. It, and and it, it changed the way I thought about it. I started thinking, well, maybe God really did have me go through all that garbage, not garbage, all those things at the place that I work so that I could do this. Maybe that's what was going on the whole time. And I'm convinced that it is. So I prayed some more about it, and I got great peace with it. Anyway, make a long story short, it's already been too long. I accepted that role, and, uh, and I did it. And it was because I tested God's will against this, right? Godly counselors, Devona and Pastor Ben. The Holy Spirit gave me peace. The Bible told me, hey, you need to work heartily, all right, but for me and not for that company over there. Right, And my circumstances had led me to the point where I could do this. That's just one example of how that all worked. <clears throat> the bottom line is we'll make right choices. We'll make choices according to God's will as long as we test the choices against his will and not against our own desires, not against our own... Um, not against what the culture would have us do. Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. And that's what we need to do. We can test God's will for us in small groups. I've been in a small group the whole time I've been at this church, and, and that's a place where it's a, a more of an intimate setting, right? We can let our guards down. We can live life together, be real together. And if we've got a major decision to go through, I will guarantee they will help us make that decision. And they'll do it with truth. They will help us uh, take our own biases out of it. So that's an advertisement for small groups, which I think, well, Pastor Ben already told us that uh, they're going to start up here soon. All right, one more. The third priority is that God wants us to hang around with other Christians. He wants us to hang around with other Christians. Now, I'm gonna, the verse here is uh, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So that seems like a weird verse, maybe, to explain why we should follow other Christians. But not really. It's saying that in our life we have two choices, right? Remember I told you that the culture in those days was kind of Greco-Roman or Roman Greco, however you say that, right? And one of their big deals was wine. They loved it. They drank all the time. And they did get drunk a lot. And, uh, and Paul is, and that, so that was kind of, that was something that the audience for this letter would have recognized. And Paul is saying, don't be like that, because all that leads to is debauchery. And, and the Greek word for debauchery here is asotia, which means, um, which, which means a, uh, a totally immoral or wasted life, a wasted life. So what he's saying here is if you follow what the culture around you is trying to get you to do right now, you're going to be led away from God to a life that is wasted. What you really need to do 
is be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always lead us to God. The culture and our own sinful nature will lead us away from him. So what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? We all, I said before, all, of us, all believers have the Holy Spirit in us, right? And once he comes into us, he will never leave. He will never leave. He will never leave us. The Bible promises that in several places. But we're not always filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be uh, always obedient to the Holy Spirit to want to be, to be excited to follow what the Holy Spirit will have us do. That means being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what holy, being filled means. And that kind of can vary over time, right? If we're around other believers, they help us be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be around other believers. Um, John MacArthur says it this way, being filled with the Spirit is living in the conscious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ letting his mind, through the word, dominate everything that is thought and done. All of what we think about, everything that we do, needs to follow what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. And if we are that way, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, verses uh, 19 through 21 tell us, Paul tells us, how, how we manifest being filled with the Holy Spirit. How can we know we're filled with the Holy Spirit? And they also tell us um, how we can aid being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's all about being in community with other believers. That's what it is. So listen to it. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So the singing that we do here is us telling God that we are filled with him, demonstrating Him to him that we are filled with him. It also helps us be filled with him. That's why it's so important. It is praising God for what he does in our lives. And, and I really like the fact that it talks about three different types of songs here, right? Psalm, they are psalms. The early church, the early uh, believers, before Christians even were, were in existence, sang the, the Psalms, the book of Psalms. The church has never stopped doing that. As a matter of fact, Pastor Jonathan had us sing one this morning, Psalm 103, and I loved that one. I didn't even know that was singing a psalm. But I asked him this week, if, hey, do we still do this? He said, yeah, and he gave me a list of them, and that was on there. And then uh, singing hymns, which are, which are songs that specifically exalt Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, and then spiritual songs. Singing, then, helps us demonstrate that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and it helps us be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we do that, um, we do that in our hearts, right? It tells us that we're supposed to do that in our hearts, and the word for heart here means our innermost being, our soul. I don't sing with beans. That's why I didn't want the mic on when I was singing this morning. But you know what? I can sing in my heart. I can resonate with God in my heart. That's what singing does for me. Listening to all of you sing makes me feel more obedient to the Lord. Makes me feel like I want to do what he wants me to do. It fills me with the Holy Spirit. That's a reason for coming here. That's one reason. Another thing we do in verse 20, we give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to thank him continuously. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 tells us to be in, in prayer continuously, right? In all of our circumstances. They are sometimes really tough. We all go through really, really hard things. But, but God tells us in Romans 8, 28 that even those things he uses for our good. He will use them all for our good if we love him. Okay, and then the last thing is, um, verse 21, we need to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. So what does submit to one another mean? It doesn't mean put everybody above yourself. What it means, though, is to be real with everybody else. It means to be vulnerable. It means to lower your guard. Let other people minister to you, and you be willing to minister to them. That's what submitting means. And a really great place to do that 
is in a small group. Again, if you want to just make a decision, if you want to just talk about life, if you want people to help you get through life, be in a small group. Okay, so Paul makes it crystal clear to us that being filled with the Holy Spirit requires us to live within community, live in community. In Colossians 3, 16 and 17, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing again, being thankful with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He wrote this in a letter to the church down the street from Ephesus. It was Colossae. He's writing this. He wrote this to all the churches. Hey, you need to be in community. That's what he's saying. Don't stop doing these things together. And then his cohort, his buddy, his protege, Luke, took it another, another step further in Acts. He's, he wrote in Acts 2, 42, and then 46 through 47, tell, explains to us what the early Christians did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and day by day attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food and with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. He's saying here, they met in big groups in the temple together, big groups like we do here, right? But also they met in smaller groups, fellowship together in their homes, in home churches. So he's saying, and I'm saying, that we need to do both. We need to be here to help each other be filled with the Holy Spirit and demonstrate that. And we need to be in smaller groups to do the same thing, but also to help one another. So, so that's the uh, third advertisement. Okay, so the priorities for me are, right, we need to be wise. We need to live wise lives, be in the Word. We need to discern His will and we need to be in community with each other, right? Now, I don't know about all of you, but I'm not very good at keeping resolutions, so I don't really like to meet them, but I am going to do those. There is one person, God himself, who's made resolutions, and he will keep them. I'm going to, we're going to look at a video clip here for a second, and it's going to, or for a minute, and it's going to tell us it's, hopefully it will demonstrate just how much he loves us. And, and that's why he's given us the priorities that he has. So let's, uh, can we play that?
That's a God who loves us. That's a God who wants us to be with him for all of eternity. And if we follow these priorities, we'll be able to do that. So, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you want us to be with you. Lord, thank you for giving us priorities in our lives so that we know what it means to actually live a life for you. And Lord, if there's any one of us in here that's, uh, that's maybe strayed from that a little bit, help us right now as we admit that to you, confess to you, and ask for your help. Help us to get back on the path to living the life that you have in store for us, the life that is perfectly planned out by you. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room who's, who's not yet made a decision for you, but they're thinking about that, I pray that you will continue to draw them to you. And you'll surround them by circumstances and other people to let them know how much they, they are loved by you and how much you want them to be with you. And Lord, if there's somebody in this room that, that maybe has, has made a decision but doesn't exactly know how to articulate that, I'm going to say some words like Pastor Ben does every week, Lord, that maybe if their heart resonates with these words, then they can say them, whisper them, say them in their heart, and, and you'll accept these words from them. Jesus, thank you. I love you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I break your heart all the time by sinning. But I also know that you promise that if I confess my sins to you, you're faithful and you'll forgive those. That's what I'm doing. I'm asking you to forgive my sin. Lord, I also know that you stepped out of heaven, you came to earth, lived a life as a human, and as fully human, fully God, and you died on the cross. You gave your life up for me. You shed your blood to pay for my sin, something I couldn't do. And then you were buried and resurrected on the third day to a new life so that I could have a new life by asking you to save me and to come into my life. And that's what I'm doing, Jesus. Please save me. Please come into my life. Please direct my life according to your priorities. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.